Oh, Patrick's ego. Welcome back to the show. <laughs> it's good to be here. I don't know why I sound like Jesse Ventura. <laughs> it's like somewhere between that and like yeah. the Cookie Monster. Come <laughs> on. All right. I went to Kentucky for my first trip two years ago. Yeah. That was the first time you ever took a trip? Is that what you said? To Kentucky. I was looking for bourbon. And he only found whiskey. I stayed next to uh, Dollywood. Wait, Dollywood is in Tennessee. Oh, it's Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> oh, He's never been. He's that never was, been to Kentucky. That was literally blasphemous. Okay. <laughs> yep. She's like, I've never been to here. Kentucky. It took you 20 minutes it. to insult Well, me. I'm done. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we deserve that, honestly. That's fine. And that's the John Chi Show. We'll see you next week. Dang it. You're listening to the John Chi Show, hosted by three Korean-American adoptees diving headfirst into what it means to be adopted, Korean, American, and more. And now, here's your hosts, Nathan, Patrick, and KJ. Welcome back to the John Chi Show for another week. This is episode 3000. I cannot believe <laughs> we, we made 3, it this far. We saw 3000 and late. I love you 3000. <laughs> I love you 3001. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I one-up you on the love, but um, everybody, it is me, your host, Patrick. All and I'm here with my fellow co-hosts, <laughs> KJ and Nathan. Tell them what's up, fellas. What's up, fellas? <laughs> Uh, fellas, here's what's fellas. up. Um, I'm Hola. in Dallas Hello. now, and it is good to be here. And also, we have a really great episode for you with a special guest. But before we get into that, Nathan, what does John Chi mean? John Chi means to celebrate or feast. Uh, at least we are calling it that. We are feasting and celebrating our Korean adoption and our heritage and what we're learning. We are celebrating together because we have actually never met. Yeah. Until as of yet. <laughs> as of yet. One until day August that will change. 29th. Mark it on your calendar. Come out to Buy Los your Angeles. Plane tickets. I hope the plane ticket Buy doesn't plane get canceled. Tickets. We are meeting. <laughs> it's gonna be epic. And pray that the Delta does not cancel Delta. <laughs> that was a yeah, little, exactly. little virus variant plane joke. <laughs> and that's what we call wordplay. <laughs> And this is Wordplay with the John Chi Boys. But we, we really are excited uh, to, to meet. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That is actually happening. We have our tickets. And we're doing a live show? Yeah, we weren't just We were doing a live show and dinner. And there's going to be some more uh, information on that. So I know this is going to be released uh, in July. So you all still have time to plan if you want to come out. Yeah, this is going to be released today. Yeah. So <laughs> we're right Brilliant now. deduction, it's being, Patrick. <laughs> all hail. It's being, <laughs> released right now wait okay. i just I, hailed myself is, I think. like now now or like patrick just back to himself now. enough silliness let's get to the interview silliness. we have a really really wonderful interview with katie gagel aka katie the cad pew, pew, pew. Um, who has been doing so much for our community and we talk about uh i mean we get into some timeline stuff but basically we talk about kind of her journey looking for her uh, birth family, her biological family, the number of trips that she's taken uh, to Korea. And um, Katie was really wonderful and really honest and vulnerable with us. I mean, as all of our guests have been, but um, we go to an especially um, unique and vulnerable place with her. And so uh, I personally am really grateful for her uh, honesty, for her candor. And I think it really helps... um, you know, provide language to some of us about the importance of birth searches uh, and why that matters. Um, and so certainly hearing one adoptee's take on what and what a birth search means for her um, and, the, and the hope um, that she is looking for, you know, coming out of that, um, I think is a really brave thing to do. And honestly, at this point, I don't know if I could articulate why I would want to go on a birth search um, if I wanted to go on one. And so uh, really grateful for her setting the example and giving us language to help maybe have some of those conversations with 
um, other people who might be curious. And uh, instead of me just being like, oh, I, uh, you know, but providing <laughs> the ways for us to speak intelligently about our feelings, about some of the things that um, that we've experienced to help other people understand. So um, not to like talk the interview up too much, but it is really, really great and really, really fun. <laughs> so here it is. Well, oh, really quickly, oh, I want to oh, jump in really fast. Okay. This was a special episode for me because... Katie has been become one of my really good friends uh, outside of you guys. Uh, I've been able to find this community, and Katie's been one of the people that's been able to help me with that and um, really been an incredible, incredible person. So I just wanted to throw that out there because I know I talk a little bit about it in the episode, but mm-hmm. um, I just want to preface again so when she's listening to this, she can hear me saying right now how good and incredible of a person that she is uh, and how proud and and humbled and honored i am to just be able to know her so well i want to say something too you rock <laughs> nope they're going to the interview too, here we go no, re- <laughs> roll the interview hurry she's awesome <laughs> no i really did appreciate everything that she said in the interview too and how much she's been doing in the uh, adoption community i really I, you know i had seen a lot of what she had done already prior to her coming on the show so um it was really good to hear that and uh, to meet her in person well mm-hmm. virtually person i guess you could call it um, yeah, definitely. Perfect. It is one of the privileges of our show to amplify voices. And so here is a big voice that we are already amplifying and making louder. Katie Gagel. Roll the tape. We are here with my good friend who I've met online and a really incredible person, fellow Korean adoptee, Katie Gagel. Katie, thank you for taking the time to join us on the John Chi Show this evening. How are you doing? Oh, just wonderful. Thanks for having me. <laughs> you are very welcome. That was a long pause between between answering. It sounded like it might have been not as good. I, I think she was probably waiting to say, are we actually going in? Because you, you kind of just jumped into this. I know we've been chatting here for a while already, but she was like, oh, is this it? Are we going? I take really long pauses, just in general. Awkward or not. It's good. Take so. take time to think about what you say before you say yeah. it, unlike me. Yeah. You might so need to great. edit that. So <laughs> No, I never that's think about I what I'm going to say. That's all I do is edit things. <laughs> <laughs> I never literally think about what I'm going to say. I just say it, and then I suffer the consequences later. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah. Yeah. No, I suffer the consequences later. <laughs> mm. That's true. Mm. I, I look good because KJ makes me look good. So that's canon for the show. I've admitted that KJ is the one that makes everyone look good. Um, anyways, uh, Katie, we're going to start off the way we start off all of our interviews and ask you to share as much or as little as you want about your adoption story. Sure. I was born in South Korea and my papers say that I was born in Seoul Clinic and maybe a few days after I was born, my birth mother left me. So I was taken to... Uh, the county office, and then they eventually took me to Holt Reception Center in Seoul. And I stayed with a foster family for, I think, four months, and then I was adopted to Louisville, Kentucky. And I grew up there, very typical white middle-class family neighborhood, went to private Catholic schools. So that was, oh, just super fun. Um... I was, I often ended up on like brochures for promos for the schools and, you know, I was the diversity. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It was super fun. Yeah. I spent a good part of that, um, really struggling with my identity and, uh, really struggled with depression for most of my teenage years and, Went to college in Western Kentucky at Murray State, which is a very rural area as well. And that was probably the first time that I interacted with Native Koreans because we had a a huge international population there. So I was really fortunate to be in that environment. And I taught ESL in the program. So that was probably my first experience of really connecting with any Native Koreans And it was super awkward because I didn't know how to connect. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) And then I went to Korea in 2009 and did a birth search, which 
you know, in hindsight, I look back on it and I don't even think I was prepared for a birth search, but I just knew, oh, this is the first trip I'm going to take to Korea. And so I did. And I was just shocked. Just everything about it. I was not mentally prepared for it. Um, So the first week was just like tourist stuff. And then the second week was a customized birth search. So they, they basically just took everything in my file and they customized it. Like they had the name of my, the clinic that I was born in. So I, I, I went with a native Korean and we went to, we tried to find the location of where it was. We spent all day and then later found out that it wasn't, it didn't even exist anymore. And I went to my hometown, which was uh, Guri. I can't even say it right. The R, that R just gets it me every time. right. <laughs> yeah, it sounds great to me. Yeah. yeah. So I went there and it, it just felt so weird just walking down the street and thinking <sighs> this could be where I grew up. And it just, it felt really devastating. That trip was devastating to me. It, I felt invisible. I felt like I didn't exist because the clinic that, I couldn't even find the clinic that I was born in. I couldn't find any, anything. The medical records get thrown out after 10 years. I had no identifying information about my birth family. And so I couldn't even find any piece of that puzzle. So one of the days we went to Holt. Um, so there were like 40 other Korean adoptees there. And you know, a good portion of the adoptees were from Holt. So those that were adopted through Holt went to the agency and we got to review our file and I met with the social worker. And prior to this trip, you know, I had grown up knowing absolutely nothing. I've seen my papers. I looked at it. There was no identifying information. But before I went on the trip, I got an email from the organization saying that they had my birth mother's name. And I was just floored just floored because so many years had passed and I just didn't know anything. And so they had said, you know, before the trip, maybe bring a gift for your birth family in case you meet them. I mean, like I remember being at Walmart at 11 o'clock at night in front of these (laughs) cards. And I'm like, what do I get as a gift to a woman I've never met? I may love, And I think about, but I don't know. So I ended up buying this like blank card. I kind of think it was a Winnie the Pooh card. I'm not sure. (laughs) And so knowing all of that information and reviewing my file in Korea, at the end, she had said nothing about my birth mother's name. So I brought it up and I said, "I, I got an email saying that maybe you had my birth mother's name. And she just looked, looked at me really weird and said, no. No, I don't think so. And I said, well, I got an email. So can we can we just look into this? I mean, I I traveled many, many miles. 12 miles. <laughs> yeah. So we went downstairs, and I guess there was a, a licensed social worker who had all the information of all, of all of us. And the woman came over with her little clipboard, and she said, yeah, I'm so sorry. We just got you mixed up with someone else and had no information. And at the time I had passed up an opportunity to go on television. That was one of the opportunities was to go on TV, national television and get like a 15 second blurb of searching for your family. I had passed that up. It felt really uncomfortable at the time, but I had thought, you know, I can do my own search because they have my birth mother's name. So I felt so devastated when I left because I had nothing. And when I returned home, everyone asked me how my trip was as if it was a vacation that I had just taken. And I had no adoptee friends at that point and came home literally devastated and grieving, but couldn't, I didn't have the words to articulate anything. So I didn't talk about it for about a year. And then and then that kind of sent me on my journey of doing a birth search every few years and 
feeling devastated every time um, and feeling hopeful at the same time and feeling dread and all the emotions, you know, that <laughs> comes with searching. Um, I laugh, <laughs> really, at inappropriate times. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I've searched, um, I think, four different times, and uh, I still have left with nothing. Um, but I haven't given up. So I guess that's in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> well i really i want to say i really appreciate you sharing uh yes yeah, all of that backstory and especially everything that goes into what you've done searching wise um you put in your form that that's one of the things about, about your story that you're most passionate about is the birth search and, and going on that journey um i was wondering if we could step back just a little bit and leading up to 2009 that first trip and that first time going, what were some of the catalysts or, or, or things that drove you to make that first, take that first step in 2009? What were some of the lead-ins uh, that you were maybe experiencing or going through? Yeah, so when I graduated high school in 2003, I was given the choice to go on a trip to Europe with my family or go to Korea for the first time. So I was 19 at the time, and I chose Europe. <laughs> Because I, I was not prepared to go to Korea, and Europe just sounded way more fun. <laughs> so up until that point, I had, I think I, I had enough awareness to realize that I was not ready to go at 19. But I knew that I wanted to go. So I think as a teenager, I had always thought about my birth mom. I didn't have the words to articulate what I felt and how I felt, but I thought about her enough. And so I always knew that would always be a part of the plan. And, and I would always say, maybe I'll live there one day, not fully understanding what that actually entailed emotionally. And I think leading up to that, I was in college and I felt so stuck in my college world. I basically hated school. I just, it, I, it was such a struggle. I hated it so much. And I tried to quit at one point and everyone just said no. So here we are. Proud of you for listening to your friends. I did it. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> so I felt really stuck at where I was in life. And at that point I had just decided I need a change. And how do I get that change? And at that point in my master's, I needed a foreign language and I needed at least two years to fulfill my language requirement. So I had found this program that was, um, it was for Korean adoptees. It was, a, it was a very small amount of people. And anyway, I just convinced everyone to allow me to take this semester to go study Korean, to fulfill my master's class, and for me to, to graduate. And I graduated. It was really anticlimactic but um i graduated <laughs> and, and we did it and, and we're here now and here we are. <laughs> basically but i think what led to it was that i just felt stuck and i needed something to change and i also was at the point where i could i had the opportunity to just do it to just go and that that basically explains like my early 20s. I didn't save any money. I just traveled. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so I just want to, I think just from the internet connection dropping out, I wanted to make sure I had the timeline right. So you um, went to Korea in 2009 and then went again for your Yeah, masters? sorry. I actually went, I actually got that out of timeline. So 2009, <laughs> I went for the first time. Then I went back in 2011. And then I went back in 2012 and lived there for a year. Okay. And then in 2015. And was that the time when you were there for the master's program? In 2011 was when I went to the the language program. Yeah. That's probably a good clarification. Sorry. <laughs> I went on. I got ahead of myself. That makes sense. Um, dang it. <laughs> I lost my question. Lost it. Go. It's go. pretty amazing. I, I, I'm always in awe of anyone who goes to live in another country for a little while. And um, I always commend those that do it just because it's such it has to be such a scary thing. 
uh, I, I was scared just to go travel for an extended period of time in another country, but to live there, um, you know, and in a country like Korea where, you know, you have roots and you have this history with, I think that's really cool, uh, to do. So, uh, what, while you were there, did you, I mean, you were th there, f uh, in Seoul specifically? I was in Ilsan, which is Ilsan, an hour okay. outside of Seoul. Okay. And then when I studied, um, I was in Kimhae, which is 30 minutes from Busan. So on yeah. the south. South side. Mm. Okay. Nice. I know what that Patrick's is. learning yeah. the geography. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Proud of you, man. Yes. <laughs> I am that retaining actually, knowledge. That is awesome. It was awesome. so beautiful living there. I woke up every single day staring at the mountains. Oh, it nice. was gorgeous. The trip in 2009 was insane. I flew into Seoul by myself and at the time didn't know anyone. And there was someone waiting for me to usher me to a bus, just like a city bus. And uh, they drove me like 45 minutes and they were like, you need to get off here. Pointing at something like that told me you should get off at this stop. I'm like, oh, how am I supposed to know who to get off? Like, like, yeah, I'm from America. We have I terrible don't public transportation. Understand. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Anyway, I sat next to this really sweet, young Korean native, and I just told her, I said, I'm so sorry. I am American. I speak no Korean. Can you help me? Because I don't know when to get off. And if I don't get off at the right spot, I might die. <laughs> so so um, she kindly told me, I think I even fell asleep, and she woke me up. I got off the bus. But then I didn't know where the hotel was. It was 11 o'clock at night. Where was I? I know it was like on the green line. Anyway, so I'm walking around in the middle of Seoul and had no idea where I was going. I just had to, I had a piece of paper. I had to keep pointing at it and going to random older men and women to ask, like, where is this hotel? Like, please, I, I just don't want to die. Um Finally, I made it, and it was fine. And then realized later that Korea is like the safest place on earth. So I think if you go around telling people that you just don't want to die, most people will help. You. I think most people will or probably help you. They misunderstand yeah. you, and they think you're picking a fight. You're like, "Do you want to die?" You're like, "Whoa, wait! Why are you coming out so strong?" Right? It's, it's only I don't want to die. You want to fight me? What's your book? <laughs> Whoa. Or, okay. or I'm dying. I need to go to this address. Yeah. Like, well, you should, yes. Maybe you should go to a hospital yeah. or you, something. No. <laughs> I mean, honestly, there was a lot of the best. interpretation. Yeah, there could yeah. have been a lot of uh, different places you <laughs> ended up. So, Katie, I'm curious. Something that I found interesting in the things, the ways that you have talked about your uh, younger self, your past mm -hmm. self, is – um, when you were, when you were in high school, when you graduated high school, you were like, I knew I wasn't ready to take a trip to Korea. And mm -hmm. then in 2009, you took a, a trip to Korea and you were like, I was not prepared. Um, what does it look like for you to be prepared to take a trip to Korea? And have you ever <laughs> taken a prepared trip to Korea? No, I've never taken a prepared trip to Korea. <laughs> <laughs> Period. Um, I don't think anything can prepare you, honestly. You know, I... I think because I deeply feel, I'm a feeler. I'm also a thinker, but I really feel. So just being in Korea and one, I think because I so, I'm such a communicator. So the idea that I cannot communicate what I want to say, how I feel to anyone, even if I have the vocabulary to say it, and even though I'm maybe have learned it before i'm I, one it's like my perfectionist mind won't let me make a mistake which is terrible for language learning but the other part is that i just i wanted to be able to to connect with people and i couldn't and i think that was the most difficult part about every time that i go and and especially when i lived there because i really you know as much as i wanted community I really wanted to connect with native Koreans and even though most Koreans know English, it was just really difficult to connect on a deep level. And that's what I really wanted. I wanted, I, I like yearned for that. And so I never went prepared. I don't think I ever could have gone 
prepared enough. Um, I think I just always tell myself this is going to be really hard <laughs> and it'll be fine. This is fine. I get that. That this is fine. I was wondering, you know, all these times you went back and uh as going back has been become part very integral to your journey, what was your engagement like with the adoptee community in Korea? Did you have any or was that something that didn't necessarily develop during your time there? Oh, it was deeply part of me being there. I loved it. I think from the first trip all the way to all the times that I've been there. It has always been a part of it because, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm living in Kentucky. So over the years, I have gotten to know more adoptees and I've met a few Korean adoptees, which has been wonderful. But when I went to Seoul for the first time and met 40 plus adoptees at one time, it was amazing. <laughs> it was amazing. Just yeah. the connection that I wanted was there. And uh, there's just so many wonderful organizations like Goal and Incas and Coroot. Like so many wonderful places that welcome adoptees to be a part of community. It was life-changing. If, if I didn't have that, my experience would have been completely terrible because they understand they understand that especially when I was living there too that I wanted to celebrate my American holidays but I didn't have anywhere to go so they would host them but I also wanted to celebrate Korean holidays and really feel connected to that like Chuseok and didn't know where to celebrate that so they would host that and so it was so wonderful because you could live in that in-between world and it be so accepted and wonderful and warm without feeling like you had to choose that identity. It's always weird to me to think about meeting a bunch of adoptees in person <laughs> just because I've all done all of this online. But like, I feel like it would be overwhelming. I feel like it would be overwhelming even to just be in a room of 40 other adoptees, like overwhelming in a good way, not necessarily a bad way, but potentially a bad way, I guess. I could maybe like freak out and be like, <laughs> I'm just making this face for the listeners. I'm just going like this and shaking my face. Yeah, there's a um, slow, <laughs> slow trickle of spittle yeah. falling out of his mouth. Oh, but he's yeah, because I just, I'm overwhelmed, <laughs> overwhelmed to the point of bodily injury. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just think what I really enjoy is hearing about adoptees who have gone back to Korea and had a really good experience uh, connecting with the community. Um, so for you coming back then, to America and like you saying, coming back to Kentucky and only knowing a few adoptees, what was it like having that connection and journey from in Korea and bringing that back here and trying to, how did you, how did you foster that from that point? I took it really hard. I think the first time that I went in 2009, you know, just, just the overwhelming amount of things that you learn, um, even as simple as taking your shoes off before you go inside and just the just the idea of my hand cramping because I had never used chopsticks that for that long, you know, it was, and like trying to cut meat. I yeah. felt like a champion when I was able to cut meat with my chopsticks. Yes. Yes, I was. It was a champ. <laughs> Amazing. But um, just simple things like that. I, I didn't know how to incorporate, but I wanted to. Um, I remember I was living at an apartment at the time and I wanted to leave my shoes outside my door, but I was like, mm, they're probably <laughs> going to get stolen. Probably not a good idea. But it was just those kinds of things that I I felt like I wanted to integrate, but I, I couldn't. And there were certain aspects. And, and I think the context of this is that I'm very all or nothing. So like, I, I really just want to be all in or all out. And, and it's really hard for me to just take bits and pieces of that and make it my own it's really hard so just the idea of coming to terms with how do i how do i be korean in america how do i be korean in kentucky and it and especially where i was it was west in western kentucky and how do i do that and what does that look like and do i accept myself the way that way um it was just it was really painful to have to navigate it by myself 
And I think as I've gotten older, it's been a little bit easier to really cash out some of those things and, and be okay with what I perceive myself as not enough Korean or I don't know. I, I, I think I've been able to come to terms a little bit more with what that identity, this Korean identity looks like in Kentucky, but it's taken a lot of work and work through shame. There's a lot of shame there and a lot of embarrassment you know, especially when, if I'm ever around like Korean Americans that, you know, have lived here that are not adopted, it's, it's really hard to work through those things by myself. So it's been a journey of kind of letting those things kind of shed off over time and really embrace myself and what that looks like now. And I think having the Asian adoptee community has really been incredibly impactful as well. It's forced me to look at my identity even more than I ever have. And that didn't really happen until last year, probably. So it's been really recent of like shedding that shame and the the guilt and the embarrassment in the last year. Yeah, I've been really um, <clears throat> appreciative of the the adoption community and just um, actually the Korean community as well. I feel I get different things from both of them. So the, the like you were saying, there's that level of, of, of shame or just embarrassment when you do something or you think about something or when you say something that's that that sounds like you don't really fully know about the Korean culture or heritage or language or thing like that. Um, and I feel... I get two different um, uh, visions from, or dif two different responses. One from the community of the the rest of the Korean adopted community. They're all like, "Oh yeah, I've done that," or "I've said that," or there's there's <laughs> like a, a feeling of like like of camaraderie is like, "Oh yeah, yeah it's, I, I feel that same way," and oh, I made that mistake. Whereas like when I meet somebody who's actually um, Korean or Korean American and they know more about it and things like that. I kind of get like this feeling that they're looking at me like, Oh, you're like the little brother who doesn't know. Or is like that. And, <laughs> yes. I, and then at first it's kind of funny, but at the same time, I'm like, and then they try to teach you or they try to inform you. I, the community is so helpful. They're always trying to like, I don't know. It's just like, Oh, here, this is what we do. And this is why we do it this way. Or this and that. And I, I love that. I really have loved that yeah. about the, the, both the Korean uh, American community and the Korean, Amer the Korean community that I met when I was in Korea. Um, and then, of course, the, the CADs out here. So, um, yeah, I, I totally hear you on that. It's, it's been it's been fun. And then you've been doing this last year, too, along with us, which, you know, we've only been doing this for the last year, too. So not less than a year, I guess. <laughs> Katie, I know that I don't know you that well personally, but I'm really proud of you <laughs> for saying <laughs> that you have gotten past the shame Um of feeling like you're not enough of feeling like i don't know just all those triggers like if somebody mentions like oh yeah chuseok is coming up and you're like what the f is chuseok and <laughs> is that a thing yeah. that i should know about is that like a video game uh announcement is that like a food <laughs> you know or like you know whatever like th th there can be so much shame and um and yeah, like I don't, I, I, you know, it's not like we've spent a long time. We don't have a long personal history that goes back years. Uh, we've only really connected uh, in the past year. And so I, I haven't been privy to all of your journey. But I think that, you know, in, in part of my own journey, uh, in, in overcoming that shame and accepting myself just as enough, you know, and just uh, being able to be like who I am is enough. And now I can become more of whatever part of identity that I want to, you know, become more in. Um, I know that that's a journey for so many Asian Americans, um, adopted or not, that is a journey for so many Asian Americans to say, you know, because maybe maybe your parents um, didn't teach you about your uh, birth country's culture and things because your uh, parents were white or because your parents are immigrant and all they wanted for you was to succeed and to assimilate and be quote unquote normal as they understood it to be, you know? Um, and I, I just think about that shared journey and how much, yeah, it could be so triggering to be like, oh, well, I don't know what how to pronounce chapche correctly, or I don't know how to use freaking chopsticks. Or like one of my weird, like funny points of shame was that I learned how to use chopsticks from like the the packaging at a Genghis grill, like a Mongolian buffet. <laughs> like <laughs> and I just like I just sat there and I was like, I'm gonna I'm gonna teach myself how to use Genghis these stinking chopsticks. Grill. Yeah. 
Okay. It's probably it's it's not great. Uh, uh, the Midwest version is hoo hot, which is super oh, yeah. problematic. That's, yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. I like the so, food, but it, yeah. I don't <laughs> like. I feel yeah. the same when I go in there. Hoo hot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I exactly. feel the hoo-ha? same <laughs> when I walk hoo-hot in there. Or hoo ha. Hoo hot. I'll put it oh, in the chat okay. so you can. Yeah. Not okay. hoo ha. I would not walk in there if it said that. Nah. Isn't that a Mongolian yeah. barbecue place? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cook yeah. yourself. Midwest. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's just. I've uh, seen it somewhere. It's not. You know, but like that's a Hoo-ha weird point of shame for Genghis me that, Grill. that yeah. that's the that's the particular venue that I learned how to use chopsticks. Not like oh, my parents taught me this and they presented mm. me with these nice metal Korean chopsticks. Not none of that. It was like nah, I just figured it out. <laughs> you know what I mean? And you're like, I don't know. Like if that story were to come out in some conversation, like I'd probably get like get some stick for it but like also like i would be laughing maybe like also kind of like gently weeping because of like, but i didn't have my my birth parents to teach me and you know all those things and yeah so anyways i'll just say um i know that that, that process of adoptees and and just asian americans in general just trying to figure out like how do we accept ourselves and how do we um move past the shame figure out how to be this blended two cultures in one body or really even three cultures in one body kind of people um, is a hard thing. And so uh, I love that you um, have gotten to this place now. Um, and I'm curious if you, w- if you don't mind, um, and it's totally cool if you, if you do, because it's, it's a hard question, but um, so you, the thing that I've heard in your story thus far and read a little bit of your notes is, um, you know, finding your birth, parents birth mom birth family is really important to you uh, and i know that you said you know that that belonging is important to you and um that one of the struggles about being in korea was like just that seeming inability to connect right because you didn't have the language you didn't have the cultural vocabulary or the history or whatever um but i'm asking this because i, I don't actually know the answer myself and i know that this is really personal and specific to each and every adoptee but for you katie when you find your birth family, what is it that you hope to unlock or lock into place? Or like, what's the thing that drives you to put yourself through the emotional labor of that search time and time again? That's a big question. Okay. Yeah. Let me, let me gather myself here. I think that... A large part of it, of why I search, is because I deserve to know. And that that part of me, I think, drives me. I think the other part is that I feel like I've struggled my whole life with, like, everything. And it's not going to fix anything. I guess the end result of... of reuniting with my birth family is not to fix anything in my life. It's, I think, closure that I want. Even though closure is painful, it's not, you know, it's not always positive. It's also not the end of the chapter. It's, you know, a beginning reunion is an extremely new and whole new chapter of living life. So I understand the complexities of it and I understand how hard it is and layered. Um, I think that I just, I don't want to assume that I can receive all of the answers in reunion. Because I just don't think that's possible. And I don't think that based on a lot of reunion stories, I just don't think that's even a thing, to be quite honest. But I want the opportunity to ask, even if she or whoever says, I'm not going to tell you, or whatever it may be, I just want the opportunity to ask any person of my family a question. And... I think that is significant enough for me. It'd be nice to have all these answers. It'd be nice to know my medical history because I've had (laughs) medical medical problems my whole life. But, you know, it'd be nice to have all these details. But I think more than anything, 
I just want the right to have that opportunity to ask. I don't know if that answers your question though. No, I mean, I think it does. Um, and like I said, it's, that's such a, like I could ask a thousand adoptees and every answer would be different. You know, yeah. um, that's such a, a hyper specific personal kind of question. And yet I think it's something that um, a lot of adoptees have inside of them is this desire to connect with their birth families. And I, the only reason really that I asked you in particular, this question is because um, this is a, a journey that you've been on and that you have taken active steps on time and time and time again. Um, and sometimes like, I, just in my own history, there have been times I'm like, yeah, I think it'd be cool to meet my birth family. And I think the only way that I could articulate it was it would be nice to um, see someone who shared my DNA, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, if and when Sarah and I have kids, like it will be nice to have um, biological kids. It will be nice to have someone who shares my DNA, which mm -hmm. then means that like I, the need for me to meet my birth family is less important, right? Because that mm. uh, itch can be scratched in a different way, you know? So then it's like, well, maybe I don't need to meet birth family. And that's the, a less driving thing. And yet it's still, um, I think, you know, the language you use was like, I, I, I need to ha be able to ask the questions, right? Mm -hmm. Even if I don't get the answers, just the ability to ask the questions uh, has been robbed from us, right? Yeah. Um, and I think it, it just kind of represents this openness and this um forever question mark and living with a question mark in 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 our lives uh is exhausting as i have found trying to <laughs> find a bunch of answers to move back to texas is like oh man i know that they will be answered at some point but like while they're not answered it is exhausting to live with that you know and so now just to to have this huge question mark that we don't even know if we'll ever be able to put out there, you know, let alone get an answer back, but just, yeah, be able to put out there and say like, is there an end? Yeah. Um, just having an open ticket open can be huge. So thanks for sharing. I was just, um, I was curious because it is, it's a lot of emotional labor to throw yourself into that search. And every time I hear an adoptee who's like, I'm doing this, I'm doing my identity work and I'm going on a birth search. I was like, <laughs> you just picked the two biggest things that like, and I know that they feel tied together and sometimes they are, and sometimes they aren't, but man, those are huge strengths of the journey. Cause that is, that's a lot. I think also I've always had support of my parents. And I think that that is significant to mention because mm -hmm. that's not, I think a common experience. And, uh, when I lived in Korea in 2012, I wasn't really going to search. I, I was living there for a year and I wasn't going to search because it was really exhausting. Um, you know, the year prior, I had gone on national television. So it was, I was kind of at a place where I just didn't want to go there again. But it was at the encouragement of my parents. Sorry, no, 2011, I didn't go on national television. Sorry. <laughs> You've been so many memory. times, you don't even know. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. No, I want to retract. Okay. Um, 2012 is when I went on national television and I wasn't going to do that, but my parents encouraged me to, to search because I was in Korea and it, it is a lot easier to do a search while I'm there. And I think it, it really encouraged me to know that the support that I had was there for me. And that's what made it a little bit easier to continue and why I still continue to search despite the pain. It is exhausting. Katie. Oh, uh, are you going to say something, Nathan? Uh, go ahead and ask a question, then I'll, I'll have a follow-up. <laughs> He's just readjusting in his seat. I was, but I, my, yeah, my question is <laughs> on a different topic. So if you have a question on this topic, go right ahead. Okay, well, I was just going to say, I was going to say one affirmation and then one question. Um, one of the reasons that I was drawn to you, your account originally uh, earlier last year um, was because of the vulnerability and just the realness that you brought to the stuff that you were sharing. You know, as somebody very new at that time, not understanding what I was thinking or how I was feeling uh, to hear, to have you 
very eloquently and cogently put it uh, in the ways that you described and how you've shared today in this interview. Um, just really, that's something that's always struck me about you is just, it's that vulnerability and then the resiliency, now hearing more of your story, the resiliency to continue on and, and to push through and and to still continue to be vulnerable. And something that you said, you talked about in your answer to KJ's question about wanting the opportunity uh, to ask the question. And something, the other thing that really has drawn me to what you do and you as a person is that you go so far out of your way to provide opportunities for people to ask questions and to do do this type of work and go on a journey that you have been on. So my question for you was just what if you are just asking if you could just talk a little bit about the work that you've done in the in the community for adoptees and what what you're doing right now to support us and to uplift us and uh and yeah and that. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't personally... know if that was a question. <laughs> that was actually my question too. So oh. now I can just uh, skip it and go straight to what I was what, like. What Patrick it didn't said. even end up in yeah. as a question, so I apologize. But yeah, that just like, yeah. Well, firstly, thank you. Oh, and I, I meant to say thank you to you, KJ, for for what you said. I think that I spent, and I think that if you ask a lot of adoptees that do a lot of work every day, I think a, a lot of us grow up not having any opportunities to connect. And I don't want the next generation of adoptees to ever feel that way. And what I want the most is to provide opportunities that can be replicated, that anyone that desires to provide spaces for adoptees can. Not because I'm anything special, it's because I just want people to be able to be themselves and be able to say whatever they want without feeling judged and without feeling guilt and shame about what they've struggled with. And, and I think that for me, that is so important for our community. And I think that's why there's so many of us in our community, because we, we feel affirmed for the first time. And I think that's really sad and I think it's really wonderful at the same time. So for me, that's why I even spend as much time as I do on social media. So that's my why. Um, currently, I host a support group every week for any adoptee. And I started that last summer really because I didn't know of any support groups. And last year, my network was I didn't really know anyone that was doing that. So I just said, hey, we'll just put it out there. Not we. I just put it out there. And <laughs> like, there wasn't anybody else. It's just there was no one else. Yeah, go for yours, I Katie. Because I didn't know what I was doing. That's that. That's my point is I had no idea what I was doing. I, I had never done anything like that. And And people showed up and people shared and people are still sharing and coming back wanting community and wanting connection. And it's really wonderful. And I don't care how many people are in it, if it's two people or if it's whatever, the point is to connect with, with other people and create community amongst us. So that's something that I've been doing since last year. And I just do a lot. <laughs> I do a lot of random things. I don't think I do a lot of like consistent things because... <sighs> It's a struggle. I'm a, I'm on the struggle bus. Um, it's hard for me to commit to things like weekly, as I'm realizing in my older age. Um, but I do a lot on Clubhouse. Well, actually, maybe not. <laughs> maybe not now. Sorry, I'm really butchering this answer. <laughs> <laughs> what it sounds like is you do a lot of things as you live your life. Yes. Um, Thank you, which- KJ. I think it's so wonderful because you're like, look, I'm just, I'm just a person doing a thing and I'm not super organized, but I think that's, you know, like Patrick said, and he's like, that's the thing that drew him to you is like, you're just like, I'm just super honest about who I am and where I'm at and wherever I am. I always want to take every opportunity to support my community uh, because they have been yes. so gracious and wonderful to me. So 
Um, in the spirit of that, where should people find you on the internet so that when you're like, hey, I'm doing a thing, they know? I, I am Katie the Cad across the board. Clubhouse, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Boom. Get those billboards yeah. up, people. <laughs> and go I, follow Katie the Cad. <laughs> and I have to dispute your your comment of saying that you're nothing special. Uh, the fact that you are listening, the fact that you are opening these channels for people that you have, um, you know, started this, this website and these, these resources for people. You started a website? So I mean, I had a, I have a website. It's like, dang, katiethecad.com. All right. There you go. Right there. She didn't list it. She didn't list it. It wasn't on my billboard. She didn't say website. She didn't say website. Yeah. All right. But shoot, I mean, I didn't know you did that. Good for you. Just the thing that you said last, uh, or uh, one of the things I noticed that you did last week that I thought was super just amazing. You you posted your Starbucks account so people could go get a coffee. Like that that's pretty amazing. I mean, the generosity that's that's flooding out of you is is great. I think that's, <laughs> that's a weird analogy, but <laughs> right, we're gonna go with it. <laughs> it, <laughs> it is generosity. Flooding flooding out of you. Yeah. Well, we were it's talking about coffee. And I started thinking out. about coffee, <laughs> liquid. Out of every out of every orifice. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> thank thanks for you. taking away my sincere compliment. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Oh, I loved you. it. No, it was good. Thank I you. loved it. <laughs> but yes, I think you're doing good things, so keep it up. Thank you. <laughs> so at Katie the Cad across the board at katiethecad.com, but www not at. And <laughs> um just Katie, thanks so much for joining us. We're gonna take a really quick break, and we're gonna be right back with a food fun item. Fun, yes. fresh, feel. Okay, we got it. I was gonna say lock, something else, but I forgot. Fun food. Nathan, you wanna roll into it? Yeah. Welcome we back. <laughs> wow. Thanks again. <laughs> Welcome back to the food portion of the John Chi Show. We are here with Katie Gagel. We just had an amazing interview, and now we're here for some snacks. We uh, were actually revisiting a revisited snack because we want to, and this one's a good one. <laughs> yes, because and, we want to. <laughs> and because this is what we have. And, you know, I think it's a good one to because, unfortunately, the last time we did this, it was only uh, the guest and myself eating it. So that's why KJ oh, and Patrick yeah. now have yeah. it. So that's right. Now so they can experience it properly together. revisited. It's revisited and with 2. Katie 5. as well here too. So now all four of us are actually eating the exact same snack. But time. Nathan, what are we eating today? The people are dying to know. <laughs> well, oh, that's right. You can't see me holding it. I'm sorry, <laughs> listeners. I'm holding. I hope, see, I'm going to butcher the name of this again. <laughs> <laughs> you're trying i don't know i don't know this is the third time French. you've done this one you i don't should speak get, you should korean there's a I lot of h's when you say that <laughs> German. there's a little accenty thing next to the d yeah i'm sorry i apologize i think it was My... solid it was a good yeah, attempt so it's that i just know that the, doesn't the that make mean cookie Kokudase. it means I don't dutch cookie it. As, as, as oh, I recall, I could like be the wrong. Packaging. Oh yeah, this is the white tort flavor. Yes. Which last time we had Vienna coffee. Yeah. Yes. Right. So we are so, eating the white. Oh, we tort. are trying something new. Anyone eating along or eating this too? <laughs> be prepared. Eating along. It is crumbly. <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, so yeah. maybe there's people listening and oh, hey, I have that in my cabinet. I'm going to go grab one. Okay, wait, John Chi people. If you listen, if you wait to listen to an episode until you're able to procure the snack please write in and tell me that would be amazing <laughs> yeah actually I, just, I need to know if that is a thing that y'all do that really let cool. us know because... if we should let you know uh, in advance <laughs> the snack we're going to be trying oh yeah yeah, yeah. It could be good we'll we try to be more organized for your sake john G people these mm -hmm. are good mm -hmm. yep told you this is exciting because this one is at least in large pieces. It's not in tiny pieces. Oh, good. Yours is not crumbly I got some and tiny ones. destroyed. Mine was a full <laughs> stick, so I'm, I'm happy that mine is not going to make a mess. I did, however, buy a small little handy vac just for my office here. So <laughs> there nice. you go. A little dust I am buster. now prepared for any snack, future snack that we have. Wait, why are you all... <laughs> 
Why are you tipping your head back getting the crumbs? Are there that many crumbs? That's how we do it on the show. Yeah, Yeah. it's like I would show you, but it's like exclusively crumbs. I don't have any crumbs in here. Well, you bought it. Yours weren't shipped. Yeah, Yeah, you bought it across the country. Okay, all right, Uh all right. I'm like, man, you guys are dedicated to the crumbs. Uh, no, no crumbs it's, uh, are left it's behind. exclusively crumbs. <laughs> no, I like to eat all cylindrical packaging like Gogurt, and I just squeeze it out <laughs> into my mouth. Ah! Oh, of course, nothing and, came and of course, out. if you've watched our <laughs> show, you know that Patrick would like to do the one bite test so he can put the whole thing in his mouth. Yeah, yeah. Oh. But, I could definitely do that with this. Yeah, this is really that. tasty. So, uh-huh. okay, Katie, I'm going to try to show you. Okay. Oh, uh, never mind. It all fell. <laughs> I can't get it out. Well, didn't work. That was very good to talk. Imagine a bunch good of good talk, everyone. I'll try to show you in a minute. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sorry. U- I'm using my scissors packaging because job was not very good. <laughs> really, you need scissors? you put you put a plastic bag in mine. I was like, what? Um, I blew it up first. Oh, did you? It was pretty <laughs> yeah. deflated by the I time I had a bunch of paper here. towel in mine. <laughs> well, we, you know, we're at high altitude and now. You're not. So, oh, yeah. okay. It Maybe, deflated. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm using scissors because I know it's crumbly and I don't mm. want to crumble it anymore. Valid. But I do see that there is an open thing and I have I know it's three so packages nice. here. Look. So I'm gonna try. Yeah, I'm gonna oh, try. How did you that. do that? I'm also Magic. not fully able bodied, so uh, hand things are mm. very difficult for me. Do you believe yeah. in magic? Wow, in my, young my, girl's heart. my mind's a little blown <laughs> that Katie just did that with the it, essentially it opened like a um a gum package uh, where it went yes. along the cross the top. I'm telling you, the packaging is just stellar. I've been opening these things like a fool. I've been, <laughs> really? I opened you, it at the end and then I'm trying the, to open it. Oh, the open? Is, is there directions uh-huh. on it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's an open sign. And it has dots. Wow. Perforated dots. And it has yeah, I didn't even dots. see the dots. Okay. I thought it was okay. decoration. It's Here's, okay. Yep, didn't even see those. Mm-hmm. Nope. I can't read. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I good, see your good. point. Oh, I why, see your why point. Like doing that? Exclusively crumbles. So mm-hmm. I may now eat more that. of these so. because I know how to open them faster. Mm-hmm. Oh. So, yeah, opened easier that time, right? <laughs> it did. Okay. No, I'm here yeah. for you guys. Okay. I'm just here. Thank you. To tell you how to open up packages. So these are made by Crown. Bless As we you. recall, there are two flavors, the white tort and the uh, Vienna coffee. How do you guys think, since you've now had both of them? We'll start, uh, KJ, how, what do you think? Of this um, one well, I'm going to try coffee? to open it the proper way. Let's see. Because this is... Uh, uh, it's going to explode all over <laughs> me, maybe? Uh, ah, yeah, yep, there it goes. Ugh. I know his rating is going down as we hear him yeah, crumble. Say, it's crumble definitely all over going down. Oh man, this is atrocious. I just um, hate when I crumb myself, so I know how you're I, doing right now, KJ. I crumbed my pants. <laughs> um, here, just explosion for the viewers wow. on the podcast. So An explosion sad. of flavor in your listeners. Mouth. Just imagine. Uh, this, so the, yeah. Anyways, um, <laughs> so I was excited because Nathan sent us a lot of them. Uh, to have a full serving size, which is four of these packets. Mm. However, due to their <laughs> crumbliness <laughs> and the fact that, um, no, yeah, just uh, the fact that they're hard to open, I think that actually knocks down the rating. Like, I'd rather just have one big package of four of these and not four little packs of these. You know what I mean? Mm. So you're saying you need some, like, styrofoam in there for protection or something. Yeah, I don't know, something. <laughs> but... Uh, I think the white tort is better. I won't say it's better. I'm more in the mood for white tort right now than I was the Vienna coffee coffee earlier. Uh, I think they're probably about the same. Like, mm, I think the white tort probably just slightly edges it. I'm going to go with three and three quarters as my you're rating. T- so you're telling me your rating five. system is based <laughs> on if you feel like having this cookie at this time? Um, no, 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 no. I'm saying, <laughs> I'm assuming I gave the, actually, I know I gave the Vienna coffee a low rating. Yeah. Uh, but like three and three quarters is the rating that I'm going to give this one. Okay. So. I don't remember what I gave the Vienna coffee for my rating. I don't, I think only Vivek gave it a high rating. I think he, only him, oh, only he was the one who was like, yeah, I'm into this. Five. Because yeah. of the crumbles, I'm sure. I'm sure of it. I feel like I agree with KJ. I think mine's going, I'm going to give it a four. Uh. Because of the crumble, the crumble definitely causing some issues, but I've not bought a box. Why did I say it like that? I've not bought a box 
of the coconut because de because that sounds like you're planning uh, on the coconut art coconut art that sounds disrespectful <laughs> um cut that out <laughs> um uh so i think if i get a box my rating may amend and i don't remember the vienna coffee that much i this was good it's I the one it a that lot. tastes like a burnt coffee but it's still it's in this slightly yeah coffee, but i like but coffee not extremely but oh that's probably coffee. why i gave it less of a rating because it didn't yeah. taste like coffee. It didn't taste like coffee, yeah. Yep, uh-huh. I remember now. I'm remembering correctly <laughs> that I gave it a crappy rating because of the coffee. Mm-hmm. Should I have said that? All right, Nathan, what do you got? I, I already did my rating. I can't remember if I, on the last oh, yeah. time I did this, I think it was about a four. I think it was Would you what change I was it? Is there any update? Nope, I'm all good. It tastes like a Milano <laughs> cookie to me. Nope. It does nothing, taste nothing like surprising a Milano. Yes. with mine. The butteriness yes. does the butter, taste that, yeah. The yeah, flakiness. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Katie, what about you? What do you think of these? I like them. They nice. taste like a, a nice little wafer. Solid. Uh, they're light, which I like. Little crispy. I love the packaging. I don't know. I give it a five. I mean, I just keep eating them, so hey, I can just yeah, keep that's going. What I'm talking about. Wow, that's a perfect five. All right. Yeah. Um, what mm-hmm. about the packaging do you love the most? Oh, I just like, like what that is it, it that like just draws it to you? Well. Really, the only reason is that it's so easy to just tear that little strip. <laughs> right. It's just so nice. Accessibility matters. It yeah. does. Yeah. Packaging people. Now that we know yeah. about the accessibility, thanks to Katie. I still didn't get it after you guys even showed it. I still couldn't figure <laughs> it out. So I'll get it next time. I think I know what I'm looking for this time. <laughs> you, just, you just keep practicing. <laughs> Well, next time we do these again, because we'll probably do them again in about four. <laughs> next time days. we do these again. For the, yeah. for the fourth or fifth time we do these cookies again. They're yes. good. I they're mean, amazing. we keep giving them low ratings because we want to keep doing them again and see if they'll get. get yeah, we got to see if they're going to update it. Yeah, <laughs> Because obviously the and guests love them. They keep giving them also, high ratings. Also, Crown, listen, if, if one of your representatives happens to listen to the show, we're not saying no to sponsorships. If you want to... Send us some things your way, our way to like have us increase our rating. Like I'm saying, yeah, that's maybe totally yes. fine. You maybe know? they have a new know. flavor like coming out. Have, you know, you're gonna have to up your your rating to get a sponsor. Yeah, Crown. You know that Billie Eilish song, "You Should See Me in a Crown." She actually wrote that about me talking about getting a sponsorship from you. So <laughs> make it happen, Crown. That was weird. this that is was how this is what this is this is the de- destiny. It is fate. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm done. <laughs> so that is it. John Chi people, if you have had either of these unpronounceable delicious treats from Crown, either the Vienna <laughs> coffee or the white tort, send us your ratings and why you gave them that. Um, you can do that by following us at John Chi Show on all of the places or sending us an email to John Chi Show at justlikemedia.com. Um, I've forgotten how we end the show because it's been a long time since we've we've done no, it. No, we want Katie. Katie where can people go back. Yeah, find go back you, you uh, on the interweb or beyond? Me? <laughs> yep. Um, Your name is Katie. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear that. Um, uh, Katie the Cad on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and my website, katiethecad.com. Here we go. Perfect. Boom. And go listen back to the episode. I guess well, they'd have to listen to the episode at the end. <laughs> they can skip. I don't know, blah, blah, blah. They can skip. skip ahead. There's time codes. So they can jump around. Yeah. If you've skipped ahead to the food portion only, shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> you can hear us talk about but shame But also props overcoming. to you for knowing what you're about. You're like, listen, I'm just True. here for the food and that's it. <laughs> we do appreciate that. All right. And now we say you can find us at John Chi Show on all the social media platforms. You can go to just like... What? You can go to johnchyshow.com. <laughs> you can go to johnchyshow.com slash support to find out all the different ways you can support the show. You can also check out uh, other things that we have on the website, uh, like the episodes. <laughs> um, you like can also ours, send us an email store. if you want to uh, johnchyshow at justlikemedia.com. We're always looking to have conversations via our inbox. And if you would so kindly take the time to go to Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and subscribe that helps us out a lot. And also is really fun to read those reviews when they come in. Um, it makes me feel very good inside. 
Um, that was weird. You can yeah, find me in Flake Patrick. Inflate Patrick's head. <laughs> yeah. Get him a bigger head. <laughs> Whoa, that was mean. Just uh, everyone, if you could all go and write, if there could just the next five reviews could just be about Patrick. It doesn't have to be about the Jackie Show at all. Just about Patrick. That would be great. Thank you. So much. Actually, I want to really quickly run it back and say, if anyone out here ed- edits video and you can take the Billie Eilish song and put my face on there with a crown, <laughs> Coke de Oz, uh thing on the on my head is a crown you'll get something special i don't know what it is yet but you will so yeah great all right and when they have made that video where can they send it to patrick they can send it to me at patrick in the world on instagram or at p armstrong on clubhouse even though you can't send video files there i also just launched a new website called patrick in the world dot me I've been working on it for a while. Uh, it's just as I'm, a, I'm getting close to being in, uh, a year of my personal journey of like coming out of the fog of, of adoption and all this other stuff. And so I've had a lot of resources and things and people that I've met that I've been wanting to share in a place that I felt like I could collect all those things. And so I did this and uh, I put it out and thank you to everybody who has uh, shown love for it. It's really means a lot to me and that's it. I appreciate it. I appreciate it looks the community real good. for sure. It looks good. I, I checked it out today. So, Thanks, dude. You're welcome. Just thought I'd put that on the record. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's Nathan's five-star review. It I looks good. It. I looked at it. It, it looks, looks good. good. <laughs> you Three can find me at uh, No Walk Photo or at No Walk. And, of course, on Facebook. And you can find me at KJ Relke, wherever I want to be found on the internet. Katie, thank you again so much for coming on the show Thanks, and guys. for eating a snack with us. And it's okay. We're, we will be seeing you many, many times more. So we will be seeing you many more times. <laughs> we'll be seeing you. <laughs> I didn't be say creepy I like that. that. Creepy at all. And if you don't see us in an hour. The next time that you find yourself in Korea and it's like 11 o'clock at night and you just got off the green line and you're like, where do I go? And like, I I just don't want to die. You'll see us. And be like, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. This is where you die. <laughs> <laughs> like, the Jachi boys are after me. Super we just comforting. Quickly became <laughs> yeah. a serial or crime podcast. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the Jachi show is yeah. It's gone How KJ serial. got away with murder. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. We got to cut okay. this off before murder happens. So great. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. Thanks Thank to the you. listeners. Thank we'll you. be back next week. Okay, Thank Jachi. You for the Hey, Jachi. Hey, Bye. Bye.